Okay, in this little mini lesson, we're going to go over colligative properties. Colligative properties, okay, is about how many particles. So colligative properties is about the properties of a solvent. A solvent is something that does the dissolving. In this course, we write aqueous to mean that we have something that's being dissolved. So really, when we write aqueous, as I keep saying, it's like a Kardashian wedding, okay? They don't stay together. It's Na plus and Cl negative. So this breaks apart into two, okay? And it's surrounded by the molecule ions. Now, what's so special about the water? Well, we know the water is attracted to these. The negative part, as we keep drawing, is attracted to the positive ion, the positive part. Now, those attractions are what pull these salts out or makes them dissolve. Now, whether it's a salt, which we use a fancy word for sometimes, an electrolyte, electrolyte, okay? Now, it's electrolyte because, as we've learned previously, ions that are free in this con condition can conduct electricity. And we already learned that salts are ionic compounds, another word for ionic, metal, nonmetal. These guys break apart into multiple ions. These ions, if they're free, whether in a liquid state or aqueous, are free to move their charge and conduct electricity. Now, in a solution, which we should know to be a homogeneous mixture, we learned in November, homogeneous, in the sense the first drop is the same as the last, we write aqueous, and it, it becomes aqueous by dissolving. Okay. Now, what am I getting at? Well, water's individual properties change, okay, as we start adding solute particles. You should know the solute, okay, is the particles being dissolved. So here's the solute, and it could be ions, it could be polar molecules. Okay, the solvent, okay, the solvent is what's doing the dissolving. In this course, it's mostly water. Now, case in point, we have two basic properties you have to know. If I've got a beaker and it contains water molecules, and we'll draw water molecules as little blue spheres, okay? Now, if I was to draw some solute particles in here, we'll make them, I don't know, black spheres, okay? And now I have some black spheres. These solute particles, notice, are now still homogeneous, but the problem here is that if the water molecule wants to evaporate, it has to get to the surface, and it's being blocked. These solute particles prevent some of the molecules to get to the surface, so we say that their vapor pressure, which should be pretty high, is actually lower. Let's pretend that the vapor pressure was 700, uh, uh, let's use a number that you use, let's use uh, 85 kilopascals, kPa. Now we know atmospheric pressure pushing down is standard most of the time in your problem, so 101.3 kilopascals. And we learned already that boiling is when the vapor pressure upward equals that. So let's pretend we're at the same pressure. Let's say we're boiling. Now if we're boiling at the same pressure, okay, this would have to be 101.3 kilopascals. But I need more temperature to achieve this pressure upward because there's things in my way, and that's the solute particles. So if you add solute particles like a salt or sugar, anything that will dissolve, you need a higher temperature to achieve a pressure that makes it boil. Case in point, you guys have seen this. You've seen liquid boiling probably. And then when you add some salt for those cookers out there, you watch the boiling disappear. Well, why? What happened? Well, when you add solute particles, they got in the way of the water, and all of a sudden, the what? The vapor pressure, not the container, the vapor pressure dropped. And now the pressure above is, is, is now higher and it stopped boiling. However, your stove is still working, and now you're able to boil at a higher temperature because guess what? You need more heat to achieve boiling. So, boiling point elevation is what occurs. All right? So the boiling point is always elevated. Now, freezing point's a little different. Freezing point, okay, is a scenario where you have a beaker 
And we have our ice in its crystalline format, regular geometric pattern. Okay. And we have water. This time the water is red, I guess. And we have our water in our liquid state. It's more dense. Okay. Then we have our solute particles. Okay. Well, the solute particles, like we talked, homogeneous mixture. And this is a liquid. Okay. The solute particles get in the way of these particles. And this thing is trying to freeze. Now, if it's going to freeze, I need, uh, let's say, this to get to this position right here. The crystal pattern would be here, here, and here. Well, if I have solute particles that are in the way of the water molecules moving, then this guy can't get to that position. That position is here. Let's pretend that's not there. Okay, so the more solute particles you put in the solution, the harder it is for these molecules to get there to get to the crystalline positions, right? The next position would be here or here. But if the particles are blocking the water molecules, they have a tough time freezing. So the freezing doesn't occur at zero degrees Celsius anymore. So they need a lower temperature, okay, to slow down these guys that are in its way to get to these positions, okay? Now today in class, I, I, I talked about it a different way, and I'm going to talk about that now. Okay, let's talk about boiling elevation first. So, if you notice, I have some what? I have some evaporation, and I have some, oop, evapor there's some condensation, gas going to a liquid. And there we have some, oh, right there, I missed it, evaporation. And there we have some, oh, condensation. Notice both things are occurring. And we have a total pressure that kind of equals out. It's called equilibrium. Okay, let's get rid of that. So, it, so when you have no solute particles, you have a certain amount of vapor pressure. And if it equals the pressure pushing down, you've got boiling. Okay, so let's talk about boiling point elevation. Now look at this movie. Now I've got, notice, the red solute particles. Okay, so I'll play this movie. Notice the condensation still occurs. We still have particles that go back into the water. There goes an evaporation. Oh, there's condensation. But you notice the red is blocking the molecules from what? Boiling, and the condensation keeps going. And you notice the vapor pressure is dropped. This is preventing molecules to get to the what? To the, to the surface. The vapor pressure is dropped, which means this needs more temperature to overcome these obstacles. The temperature of the boiling is elevated anytime you add particles. And the more particles you add, the boiling point's new boiling point is raised. We call that coolant. As you add more particles to water, the new threshold for boiling is now higher, and that means you need a higher temperature to achieve. So the coolant in your car prevents uh, the, the liquid that's cooling your engine from boiling. We don't want it to boil to produce uh, heat, uh, I'm sorry, gas, which creates pressure, which will blow out a line. Okay, so let's go to freezing now. If you go to freezing, okay, now freezing, I have my water in my crystalline structure, I want you to watch the melting and the freezing that occurs. So you notice at zero degrees Celsius, we have some melting and some freezing. Look at them particles that are coming right there. That just, that just froze. These guys are about to freeze, but there's some what? There's some melting going on. So melting and freezing are both happening. We call it equilibrium. Okay, so if I have the perfect cooler with no heat going in, this would maintain the same amount of grams of ice. The ice would change its shape, but the rate of melting equals the rate of freezing. Let's add some solute particles that get in the way again. Freezing point, uh, the, uh, here we go. Now, there's my solute particles. Now, watch carefully. Are they getting in the way of the freezing or the melting? Yeah, they're blocking the liquid molecules from getting to the site to become part of the crystal. So they're preventing freezing. Therefore, the rate of melting, which is going on, keeps going, and by dropping salt or any kind of compound that dissolves, you lower the freezing point and the ice melts. Believe it or not, by blocking the refreezing, that's how it, it melts faster. And therefore, to get these molecules here that are getting in the way to move slower, we need a slower amount, we need a slower amount of energy. So to make these molecules move slower so these molecules can get by, we need a temperature that is lower. So the freezing point requires even lower temperature to freeze because of the what? The particles that are in the way. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a boiling point that always gets elevated when you dissolve. The boiling point of the solvent, the water, 
it's elevated as you add particles. And it leaves me a boiling point that is low, I'm sorry, a freezing point that is lowered. Now we call freezing point depression, right? The freezing point, we need a colder temperature to make this freeze and a warmer temperature to make this boil. So we call chemicals that do this are coolant and chemicals that lower the freezing point enough so it doesn't freeze, we call that antifreeze. They're the same exact chemical because they do the both things. Now in class, I showed you a thumbs up. There's my thumb going up. And I showed you the thumb down. That's the hand signal to show that the higher temperature always goes up. The higher temperature is the boiling. And the freezing temperature, the lower temperature of the, of the solvent, always goes down when you add solute particles. Now the only little trick now is to recognize that salts or electrolytes will dissociate into more chemicals. Sodium chloride really is two particles. It's Na plus and Cl negative. So for the same amount of sodium chloride, let's pretend we have one molar solution of sodium chloride. And let's say I have a one molar solution of, say, glucose. They both dissolve in water. And you would expect the boiling point and the freezing point to go up the same, the boiling point to go up as much and the, the freezing point to drop the same much. But because sodium chloride breaks apart into two more particles, we would times this number by two. So really a one molar solution of sodium chloride is really a three molar solution of particles or ions. And the more stuff that gets in the way, the greater these changes. Okay. Now, if I compared sodium chloride, which is rock salt, with calcium chloride called ice melt, we'll get to the other reason for that later, this breaks apart into two ions, Na plus and Cl negative. This breaks apart into three ions. So if I had equal amounts of these two guys, they are the one that melts more ice would be this guy. So if I had a two molar solution of sodium chloride and a two molar solution of calcium chloride, don't I really have a four molar solution considering the particles, two times two? And don't I really have a three, uh, a, um, a six molar, I'm sorry, three times two, I can do this, six molar solution of ions? So calcium chloride will melt more ice because it drops the freezing point lower, okay, because it produces more ions. So when I compare different chemicals, make sure you compare chemicals that are molecular that do not break apart in the ions, we call them covalent, and chemicals that are ionic, which we use the word electrolyte. Remember, we talked about that in the beginning of this, the word electrolyte, okay? So go through the problems I gave you, either in the worksheet or the Castle Learning, and you'll see this coming up. Okay, you're welcome.